Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Scientific Writing for Journals at UMT. Uh, I'm Mabel Tang, Account Development Director for Asia. On the line with me today is my colleague, Ken Yip, Licensing Manager of Malaysia and Brunei. Uh, we will be moderating the section and answer some of your technical questions, if there is any. And before we start, I have several housekeeping. Everyone is muted during the whole section to avoid any background noise, so as to achieve the best audio effect and for recording purpose. So if you have any question, please type in the question box on the control panel on the right-hand side, and the speaker will answer at the end of the presentation. Please make sure your audio is properly set. You can check it on the audio also on the control panel. Choose either computer audio or phone. At the end of the talk, when we close the webinar, there is a short survey. Highly appreciated if you can fill the survey and let us know how do you find the webinar and what topics you would like to hear in the future. And an e-certificate will be attached with the follow-up email, which will be sent to you tomorrow. The recording and the slides will be shared by UMT Library later. Uh, it's a small group today, so we would be glad if you can engage more with you directly. So please don't be shy and ask as many questions as you can. And today we are glad to have Dr. Abhitab uh, Prakash be our speaker. Dr. Abhitab is an Auckland-based senior editor and is part of the Springer Nature AIDS publications team. He is editor-in-chief of the American, American Journal of Cardiovascular Drugs, co-editor of Clinical Pharmacokinetics, and a section editor for the cardiovascular drug therapy content in the following ADIS journals. Drugs, drugs and aging, pediatric drugs, CNS drugs, and pharmaceutical medicine. He has been a journal editor at ADIS for the last 21 years after spending seven years teaching pharmacology and therapeutics at the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, laterly as an assistant professor. Without further ado, I pass it to Dr. Abhitab. Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, I, I can't see if I'm on, so you can tell me if I'm on and my slides are on. Um, have you shown your video? Oh, yeah, we can see you now. You can see me and you can see my slides? Yes. Thank you. So, so let's make a start. At the outset, uh, in this COVID-19 situation, I think we've all got used to the fact of PowerPoints and webinars, which are, I personally find extremely boring. So I will try my best to keep you entertained and impart some knowledge along the way. So I haven't forgotten how to have a conversation without PowerPoints and you will have a chance to test that at the end of the session. Uh, as Mabel said, I did my MBBS from, in, from New Delhi. I did my master's in pharmacology, and then I taught pharmacology for about seven years in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And then I moved to New Zealand into a career in publishing. And the first two years as a medical writer, when I actually wrote manuscripts and had to deal with peer review and rejection slips. That was the hardest part and that is what I'm going to try and help you with here. So the object of this lecture is not how to teach you how to write a paper. It's to provide you with some a snapshot of the publishing process and of how I view an original research paper. When I receive a submission, what do I look for and where? These are the ADIS journals that I work for. If you work in the pharmacy or drug therapy field, medical or paramedical, I'm sure you would have come across at least some of these titles in your local library. Clinical Pharmacokinetics is my primary journal. It has an impact factor of 4.6. It's been around for 45 years. The site score is 8.8, .8, and it's ranked eighth out of 237 journals in the pharmacology category. I've been editor-in-chief since 2005, so about 15 years I've been running the journal. And since last year, I've got a co-editor-in-chief, a colleague who helps halfway through the journal, you know, half of it is his. 
The other journal is the American Journal of Cardiovascular Drugs. It has an impact factor of 2.674. It's 60th out of 138 journals, a site score of 4.7. And I run it with Professor Michael Linkoff of the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio. And I am the founding editor-in-chief. I floated this journal in 2001, and I'm going to be the editor for 20 years now. Next year, we're celebrating 20th anniversary. So the agenda for today is what an editor looks for in a manuscript. Anatomy of a good original research paper. I use the term anatomy because not only like the human body, not only does it have to have the essential components, but they have to be in specific locations. So if there is going to be a heart, a beating heart, it has to be in the thoracic cage on the left side of your chest, hopefully. Having a beating heart between the knees is of no use to anybody. The editorial process, a snapshot of how the editorial process works. Peer review, how to address peer review comments, how to revise a manuscript. And then finally, we'll touch upon journal selection as to how to select a journal to submit your work. So coming on to what are the things that an editor looks for? The first thing is the paper has to be within the aims and scope of the journal. So no matter which field you're working in, medical or non-medical, you have to read the instruction for authors. Once you decide on, okay, I would like to submit to this journal, you have to read the aims and scope of the journal and the detailed instructions for authors. You will be surprised that how many animal studies I get. The journal's name is clinical pharmacokinetics, clinical as in humans. And you will be surprised how many animal papers I get. The other thing, once it's broadly within the aims and scope of the journal, I will look at novelty of the work. And by novelty is very simple, it's newness. How, how new is it? Has, has it been done before? And it's not always the first study on the subject, which is always hard. So there are grades of novelty on, is it the largest study on the subject? Are you looking at a subset that has not been looked at before? What is the importance of that paper? You know, the work that you've done, the importance in the field. So in my field, it's clinical relevance. Will it change patient care? But even in any other field, you know, soil sciences, astronomy, point is, what is the importance? How is your work going to advance the field? Now, again, every paper does not have to be a quantum leap. You don't have to boldly go where no man has been before, but it has to be a incremental work. What does it add to what we already knew? The fourth point is technical quality. Has it been done well? Has it been, is the work done as well as could have been done? Have the methods, appropriate methods been employed? And have you done executed those methods accurately. Then is the international readership interest because both my journals are international in scope, even though it is called the American Journal of Cardiovascular Drugs. It has an international scope. And as an editor, I'm trying to improve my journal. I'm trying, I want the whole world to read my journal. So I'm looking for manuscripts which have findings that are applicable beyond a certain country or a geographic region or a continent. And last, of course, is something which the authors have no control on. This is the balance of topics and article types. So in clinical pharmacokinetics, we cover the what the body does to drugs across the board. So in oncology, endocrinology, cardiology, neurology, psychiatry. And I look for a balance of topics. So when I assemble an issue once a month, I look for a little bit. Again, I want it to appeal to a very broad readership. So it's not going to be just clinical pharmacokinetics of anti-cancer drugs, because then only oncologists will read it. So there has to be a balance of topics, a little bit of neurology, a little psychiatry, a little cardiology, a little oncology. So I will look at the balance and I can see my copy status for the next 12 months, right? So when I get a submission, I'm looking at what's already in the pipeline, things that you cannot see. And I'm looking at article types. So there's only so many original research articles. I try to put half original research, half review articles, Within the reviews, there are leading articles, current opinion pieces, you know, detailed reviews. So that is entirely up to the editor, which authors have no control on. Now, looking at novelty and importance, as an example, I share this title with you. Efficacy and tolerability of add-on treatment with extended release nifedipine in hypertensive patients not controlled on monotherapy. 
it's an eight week single arm observational phase four study in 200 patients as an editor the first thing that leaps out at me extended release nifedipine nifedipine is as old as the hills there is practically nothing about nifedipine that we do not already know so this paper is using a pharmaceutical formulation basically extended release nifedipine low interest it's an eight week study hypertension is a lifelong disorder once you're diagnosed with hypertension it stays with you till you're dead eight weeks is neither here nor there it's a single arm study so there was no comparator so whatever you found you found with nifedipine and you have no way of telling me it would not have happened with placebo or with a comparator 200 patients hypertension affects i would say 30 percent of the adult population on earth you have a study on 200 patients now if this was 2000 or, or, or 20000 patients observational study i may have woken up but at this stage sorry this doesn't tick the box for novelty neither for importance now on the other hand you look at this current opinion piece now in 2019 levothyrox is a thyroxine replacement therapy for people who have hypothyroidism and levothyroxine was sold in the market until last year and then last year a new formulation was launched and suddenly people patients who had been taking that one formulation of levothyrox was switched to the other new formulation and this was suddenly very important and there was an opinion piece which said no they're not equivalent you have to be very careful when you shift a patient from one formulation to another formulation within a span of 18 months 18000 downloads 23 citations 99 alt metric score seven news outlets have picked up this article now this as a journal editor is music to my ears this means it is very very important it is topical and my readers have loved it 18000 of them have downloaded a free copy so coming on to the anatomy of and what an editor looks for and where we'll go over titles abstracts introduction the imrad the introduction methods result and discussion We'll talk a bit about figures and tables in our original research paper, references, authorship, acknowledgement and disclosures, what you should and shouldn't disclose, and plagiarism and fraud, the dark side of publishing and research. So coming on to the title, what should a good title include? Uh, uh, sorry, this is a cover letter. I've shot ahead of myself. So a cover letter needs to introduce your manuscript to me because that is the first thing that I will open is a cover letter. So manuscript title, article type, is it original research? Is it a review, a current opinion piece? Why your study was important? Why is the question important? Why are you even working in this area? What did you find? You don't have to go into the whole detail. Just give me one or two key findings. Why is it suitable for my journal? You know, it is suitable for publication. Why my journal? And if you want to include or exclude peer reviews, and of course, a statement on ethics. So you can propose reviewers, try to make them neutral people who are, have no conflict of interest. So preferably not your father, not your spouse, not your child, not your colleague, the person you've been publishing with for the last 10 years. Those would be inappropriate peer reviewers. Similarly, you can exclude peer reviewers, but then you have to give me a reason why. So you can say there is an intellectual conflict of interest. We never seem to agree on each, anything. We are working on similar sort of um, intellectual property conflicts of interest. So you can exclude peer reviews, but tell me why you want to exclude them. And you have to convince the editor why I should send your paper out for peer review. Okay, so I'm the first line whom you have to convince. Obviously, the cover letter should be addressed to the correct journal and editor. Again, when people have had a couple of rejections, they're so glazed over that they will just use the same cover letter and send it to the next editor i do receive covering letters that are not addressed to me or my journal it should be grammatically correct without typographical errors because if you can't put together a, a one sheet letter then how careful have you been with your research work and what have you done in the manuscript it has to be succinct show me your ability to be accuracy brevity and clarity not more than one page in length because these days attention spans are very limited so it's 140 characters on, on twitter so a single sheet of paper a single a4 sheet a single screen 
I, I should be able to get the gist of what you're trying to say on a single screen. Don't exaggerate or overstate your results. I mean, in the covering letter, you don't have to go overboard and suggest that you know the 2021 Nobel Prize will be given to this work. Admit if you've submitted it before and you've been rejected, sometimes you have received reviewer comments. If so, then what were the comments and how have you changed the manuscript to address those comments? So the one, the version that you're submitting to my journal, tell me how it has changed to address previous reviewer concerns, okay? It serves two purposes. One, it educates me on what has already been done. Two, if the previous comments were extensive and you've done a major revision on it, I may not send your paper for a formal round of peer review and I may only send it to a single editorial board member for his opinion. Because I personally believe everything that could have been corrected has been corrected and there's no point in reinventing the wheel by another round of peer review. Don't try to hide them, okay? So always all peer review comments that you've received, whether we will discuss this on how you can address review comments and you know you can oppose some comments. We'll come to that at the end when we talk about editorial processes. So here's a cover letter. Dear editorial board, so it's not to the journal. He hasn't been to my website. He doesn't know who I am. We would like to present a trial, a trial, which is highly relevant to patient safety issues. Okay, broadly, pharmacovigilance. It is relevant for the implementation of all safety structures in medicine. It can be assumed to be highly recognized as well as frequently cited. This letter tells me nothing. In fact, it potentially confuses me as to where they're going with this. And obviously they're trying to entice me by saying it's going to be cited a lot. It's not convincing. Here's another classic letter. Dear editor, please consider this manuscript for possible publication as a short communication in clinical pharmacokinetics. That's it. That is it. That is the cover letter. And then there's a manuscript attached to it. So now it's up to me as Sherlock Holmes to go and find out who done it. So don't underestimate the power of a good cover letter. You know, take your time, write that cover letter, give it some thought. Coming on to the title, title of an original research paper, what are the essential components? PCOS is a mnemonic, you can get that, a population or the problem that you studied, the intervention or exposure, the comparison, the outcome that you've measured or achieved, and the study design, PCOS. So if you look at the key words of your paper, you know, once you've done your study, what are the key words? What are the words people will use to search this paper, to find this paper on Google or on PubMed? If you can identify the keywords, try to weave them into the title because the title is up front. It's, it's freely available on PubMed, on Google, although Google tends to truncate it at I think 65 words. So try to weave in keywords or mesh terms, medical subject heading terms, into the title of the paper. Whether it should be an indicative or declarative title, indicative titles are the ones that tell the reader what was done without telling them what they found. And a declarative title will tell you what they found in the, in the title itself. Now, certain journals have policies around this. Some have a preference for indicative titles, some have for declarative. You will have to check the individual journal's website. I personally, don't favor I one over the other, whatever the author wants to go with, that's fine. Now, if you look at PCOS, here is a, a title. Epixaban, which is an anticoagulant, prevention in the prevention of venous thromboembolism in patients undergoing hip replacement, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. It has all the components above right there in the trial, but it doesn't tell you whether Epixaban worked or not. So this becomes an indicative title. If I was to make this declarative, it's very simple. Epixaban is effective and well tolerated in the prevention of venous thromboembolism in patients undergoing hip replacement, results of a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. So as simple as that, you can change it, but the key words and the essential components, the PCOS remains the same. Now here, these days when people are going through Google and Google Scholar, be aware that a title may be the only thing they read. So unless the title has these essential components, they won't actually even go up to your abstract. Here are some catchy, cute titles, which I personally believe should be avoided. Hoop, there it is, surprising resurgence of whooping cough. Fantastic yeasts and where to find them, really. 
mirror mirror on the wall who is the most malignant medulloblastoma micro irony of them all wax on wax off cubic hair grooming and potential complications interesting factitious diarrhea a case of watery deception ooh did you really need to conjure up that image i mean this is this is the serious 16 year old who's having anxiety issues and he's adding water to his tools pretending that he has diarrhea i mean it's a serious enough thing it's a case report but yeah avoid cute and catchy titles coming on to the abstract abstract of a paper is succinctly what your readers want to know snapshot why the study needs to be done so introduce the topic what's the, what's the gap what are you trying to do here what did you do so your aims and methodology what did you find key results how this study will advance the field now here is the conclusions and implication or some people call the discussion information in the abstract must match the body text so the act, abstract should be an accurate reflection of the body text some journals recommend a word count so i think springer nature journal still enforce 250 words because pubmed used to in the old days truncate abstracts at 250 words so if you had a 500 word abstract they would just chop it off at halfway point and 250 words would go up on pubmed but those days are long gone these days 400 words is fine it's always good to be able to succinctly summarize your findings so 250 words is a good target to aim for but it's not set in stone anymore structure i personally believe when you're writing the abstract you should use the imrad headings in mind so introduction methods results discussion if the journal dictates that they don't use headings in the abstract you can always rip off the headings and it will run fine in text but when you're writing the abstract i suggest you put at least keep those headings in mind and again the abstract should accurately reflect the text because what happens is sometimes when i read an abstract it looks like this then i get to the introduction and it's not looking half as impressive by the time i get to the results it looks like me so that's not exactly the right way to do it so the abstract should be an accurate reflection of what you've done coming on to the introduction now this is a very important part this is where you grab the attention of the reader i have i've read your title it was a good title i read your abstract i've come to the introduction now this is where you grab me by the scruff of my neck and make me read your whole work first thing is why is this research question important why are you working in this field what other work has been published and what are the gaps in the area and the third bit is what specific research question are you going to answer what exactly are you going to do this is very important the structure is very important because the first few sentences will grab my attention the second part will highlight the gaps and the third is a question that in this study we set out to find what it was your objective what are you going to find this is very important because the last sentence of the introduction tells me exactly what you're going to do and this question will be answered in the first sentence of the discussion so the last sentence of introduction is very important what specific what exactly are you going to do about it why should i go further then we come on to the method section the methods of course if you look at the heaviest objects in the universe this is the sun as you know a unit a neutron star looks a bit heavier a black hole is definitely heavier and these are my eyelids when i'm reading the method section because we all agree that the method section is the most boring part of a paper you can write the method section even before you've done the experiment okay so take care provide the study design and the controls always define the method from the for the primary endpoint first then followed by the methods you will use for studying the secondary endpoints this order is important so primary endpoint the method for the primary endpoint first secondary endpoints to follow describe new techniques in detail but reference standard method so if you're using standard methodology you don't have to spend too many words on it now broadly speaking original research paper is about 4000 words right and the introduction you've already already taken about 300 350 words so in the methods 
just provide references for standard techniques but again you want people to be able to replicate your work so if you're using a new technique you have to provide some detail for it include statistical methods and the rationale so it's not just we use students te test t test and we use set of p value 0 0.05 what were your assumptions on which you based your statistical tests you know why did you get this and the blue the blue text is only for clinical trials where you're testing a drug or anything on patients where you need inclusion exclusion criteria an ethical approval a patient consent you know explicit consent and trial registration details if appropriate if you're doing a prospective study in humans so you have to give enough detail for a reader to replicate your work on some other part of the planet coming on to the results what did you find and structure and subsections are important so that it helps if you have a huge body of work subsections will be make your paper very reader friendly and i can easily skip to the areas of my interest have you presented the data to answer your research question remember the last sentence of the introduction have you presented the data that answers the question and do all the methods have a corresponding result again the results will be presented in the same order as the methods so primary method first primary result first secondary method secondary result second secondary second secondary result third secondary and onwards okay so they all follow in the same order and when you are revising papers you have to take care that if a referee says remove this sixth secondary endpoint because it is irrelevant always remember to remove the sixth method you know sometimes the method still lingers you remove the result to address a referee comment but you haven't removed the method so show the reader what you found whether you can explain it or not whether it fits in with your hypothesis or not is not the point the results section you simply state what you found then we come on to the discussion and the first sec sentence of your discussion is answers the question of the introduction what did you find you know so we set out to find so and so the first sentence will say okay what did you find how do your results fit in with the others so you don't regurgitate all the results again you are comparing and contrasting that compared to what has gone before us this is what we found something similar something different and then you're trying to put it in perspective of okay we found it similar to what others have found but the novelty of our work is that we had a larger patient group or you know we were looking at separate sections of patients and then you have to look at the strengths and weaknesses or limitations of your work so obviously you set out to do the best method you could so it has some strengths nothing is ever foolproof there are always limitations even if you do randomized double blind placebo control trial there are always limitations so be upfront acknowledge the limitations but then try to put those limitations into perspective so it's not just to say that okay we used an open label design open label design is a limitation of the study so what did you do to minimize the bias that would have been introduced by that limitation so even though this was an open label study it is the largest study of its kind with 50000 patients areas for potential new research obviously like i said incremental science everything is baby steps we are standing here today because of the last 400 years of progress it wasn't over the last four days and the conclusion so don't give me a conclusion to say most research is needed that is very wishy washy i mean you had a perfectly good introduction where you had a good hypothesis in mind you use the right methods and statistics you use the right results so now you have to have a conclusion you can't say more research is needed because that means you wasted your time and mine okay so i'm not saying rocket science but you have to have a firm conclusion that in what we set out to do this is exactly what you found sure there is room for more research that is already will dent with after the strengths and limitations so place your results in context and at the end of that you have to tie everything back and forth okay why was the study done what you did what you found methods results how you've advanced the field and then you tie it back and forth okay so problem in the field the objectives leads to objectives methods results and figures summary of findings implications to the field and make sure it all sticks together because sometimes if they're not logically linked and you've been through many many rounds of peer review your manuscript can start looking something like this which i'm sure started off as a good 
attire or some description, but at this stage, it doesn't look like anything to me. So coming on to figures and tables, figures are excellent. They illustrate a key finding. You want to draw the reader's attention to that one important finding. Make a figure. You want to make a visual impression, you know, something that lasts, it has an impact. And clarity is far more important than beauty. So it should be easy to understand. Okay, so one figure, look at Kaplan markers, excellent figures. I mean, they summarize so much data behind those two little worms, and especially when they start diverging, when they started diverging, how quickly they went apart, and at the end they reached a p value 0 0.001, whatever. They are very simple, very effective. Think about colors. In the past, when there was a lot of print journals and print copies floating around, some publishers were charging for the use of color in figures. I think those days are long gone. We never do, we never did. These days, a lot of it is online printing. People print, uh, you know, download PDF files. And I personally think colors look really good. They add a lot of life to the figure. In tables, tables are excellent to present numerical data. You know, strings of numbers, lots of numbers, 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 numbers. You can bung them all into one big table or three tables or four tables. You can emphasize statistical analysis because you know the p values are sitting in one separate column at the end. And if you've got statistically significant p values, you can bold them. It's very, tables really bring out the p value, which would get otherwise get buried in the text. Don't repeat the results from the table into the text. You know, use your text wisely because the numbers are already in the table in the results section. So use the text in the results section to talk about significant differences and what you found. Just simple, don't, not in perspective, just what you found. But don't repeat all the numbers again in text. Number of rows versus number of columns. Well, I'm a dinosaur, so the rule of thumb in my day used to be twice as many rows as columns. So look at the data that you've got. So two rows for every column. So the more data you got should be in the rows, lesser in the columns. How many figures and tables in a manuscript? Again, you know, how long is a piece of string? In the old days, there was uh, a, a rule of thumb which said one figure or table for every thousand words. So that was basically four. You have either two figures, two tables, three tables, one figure, you got four in 4,000 words. But that is all in the past. That is, that is all not set in stone. You use your figures and tables wisely use them to present your data adequately. And you can always use electronic supplementary material. These days in digital printing, you can submit all the supplementary, the unimportant figures and tables in a supplementary document, almost unlimited sort of capacity these days to host digital content. So stick to the most important bits in the main manuscript. The rest can be supplementary electronic material. References in the paper, they have to be relevant. Okay, you just don't cite 10 papers from your own group trying to be become the most influential group on that topic because to me that will suggest that your group is the only one working on the topic. Nobody else is interested in the topic. So they should be relevant. Don't unnecessarily cite yourself to build your credentials in that field. They should be current. Okay, why? Because I use your references to find peer reviews for your work. Obviously, if you're citing their work, they work in the same field. I will invite them, if appropriate, to act as peer reviews for your work. So, and it suggests to me if all the references in your research work are from 2013 to 2020 or 2015 to 2020, it suggests it's a very active area, lots of diverse groups working in the area. So it suggests a lot of reader interest, right? If you have an original research paper and the most recent reference you can find is 2000, that suggests that the area is already dead. It's been buried, people have moved on to newer pastures. And if I publish this piece of work, nobody will read it, nobody will cite it. It's of no interest. Original research versus review articles, preferably always cite original research. Okay, read the original paper, then cite it. Sometimes you can't avoid citing review articles, especially for statistics and incidence and prevalence rates, which is fine. But be wary, when you're citing a review article, you are placing a lot of faith on the authors of the review article and that they have interpreted the primary data correctly. Should you cite references from your target journal? Sometimes people do, 
they are trying to suggest that because clinical pharmacokinetics has published these two papers, which are relevant to my work. So your journal is interested in this area, which is why you should be interested in my work. How many references? I personally don't believe in putting an arbitrary limit. I mean, use your common sense, use your reference list to inform the readers of, okay, this is interesting work. Where can I find out more about this topic? Okay, think from the reader's point of view. And some journals do have a cutoff. I am aware that original research articles can have a cutoff. I think it's in the vicinity of 18 to 25 references for original research piece, but I don't think that's fair. If you need more, then cite more. Coming on to authorship. Specifically for biomedical papers, because both of my journals are pharmacology related. So we use the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors criteria. And you can read all the text. I'm not going to read it out for you. Basically, everybody who's an author should have provided intellectual input, should have taken part into writing, devising, should sign off on the final version, and should agree to be held accountable for the whole work. So if you are an author, you are responsible for that work. And if something bad happens to it, and if so, it has to be retracted later on, you cannot extricate yourself by saying, oh, no, 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 it wasn't me, it was the other guy, it was the corresponding author, it was the, the first author who did everything. No, 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 no. Those days are long gone, okay? These days, every author is held equally responsible for accountability purposes. So be very, very careful of unethical authorships. Do not lend your name to a paper that you cannot, you know, be held accountable for. If you don't know the person, if you haven't participated in the work, if you don't meet all four of these criteria, not one, not two, all four. If you don't meet all four criteria, do not become a co-author. Because this is the digital age. Once something gets published online, it never goes away. You can, you can remove it from the net, but trust me, Google has made backup copies. There are 100 people who've made backup copies. So if something is online, it is there forever. And you don't want your name in a dodgy research piece. Acknowledgements, acknowledgements and disclosures. Again, acknowledgements are for contributors who did not meet the authorship criteria. So there was a, a colleague you discussed with who, who critiqued your paper. You took in that feedback and you improved your paper before submission, fine. They don't meet the authorship criteria, but they did contribute. You have a statistician who did the statistical analysis, but does not want to be held accountable for the research work in your lab, fine. Acknowledge their input. Anybody who contributed to your paper what does not mean all four criteria should be acknowledged. Writing assistance, again, if you've used writing assistance, English editing assistance, who funded it, acknowledge it. Disclose the source of funding for your study. It's very often I see no funding was used. What do you mean no funding was used? You use somebody's lab, somebody paid your salary, somebody paid for the funnel and the equipment that you use, so somebody funded it. So it could be departmental funds, it could be university grant, it could be a grant from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then disclose all potential conflicts of interest, financial, intellectual, any conflict of interest, potential. And be aware that all disclosures are not necessarily published. I mean, you can say I took a grant from Abbott in 2002 on a drug that is no longer available in the market. That grant has nothing to do with anything. It's not related to this current work, which is fine. So you can disclose it, but I don't think I'm going to publish it in my paper. Sometimes people tend to misuse acknowledgements. Here's one acknowledgement in a recent paper. We apologize to colleagues for not citing their work in this field because of space constraints. What a waste of space. What a wishy-washy excuse for a man. I mean, is this the best reason you could come up with for not citing a friend? Here's another classic example. This one is from uh, archeology, span paleontology. Look at this. Acknowledgement. I draw your attention to the last sentence. Caleb M. Brown, CMB, would specifically like to highlight the ongoing and unwavering support of Lorna O'Brien. Lorna, will you marry me? Really? This is where you're going to propose? I mean, this is your major life decision? Well, I'm very happy to report here's Caleb and Lorna. She did say yes, they are happily married and may they live happily together for decades to come. But please don't do that in my journals. Coming on to the darker side of science. Duplication and plagiarism, it's very easy to catch you. 
okay so don't even go there don't even think about going there we have paid software to catch you there are free software to catch you so when i get a paper submitted to me my technology and publishing colleagues they already run it through authenticate and crossref i get something like this is a similarity with other published content i get a recommendation reject the damn paper and that's the end of the paper i don't read the title and the abstract this is already done and when i click on that 71 percent i get a detailed breakup of exactly which sentence was lifted and all these red sentences were lifted from a single paper okay so my words to you as young researchers early career researchers don't even think of going there google google scholar you know just take a chunk of text and paste it in the google search bar within seconds it will show you where it's been lifted from okay don't manipulate images because software is getting smarter these days if you try to flip you know western blocks and what have you hplc images we will catch you fraud again is harder it's not impossible fraud is not manipulation it is patent like you've cooked up data and it is harder to detect but trust me science is self-correcting and you will be caught out in the long run and like i said once you are caught out your name is mulled your photo your name will be famous forever and nothing in the digital age ever goes away so don't go there so coming on to the editorial process this is just a quick snapshot of what happens in the editorial process you submit a paper to me i look at it for basic requirements either i outright reject it so i like i said i am the first line of defense if i think it's good enough you've convinced me i send it out for peer reviewers peer reviewers will evaluate and recommend again it's important peer reviewers make recommendations they don't make decisions they make recommendations it comes back to me i assess their comments i rate their comments i make the decision the editor makes a decision either it's a reject or it's an accept or more likely it is revised with major or minor revision so i will send it back to you for revision and it will go through the same cycle again if it's got minor revisions and nothing major needed to be done i may not send it for a second round of peer review i may just look at it and say yep fine you've done everything off you go to publication or i can send it around back to the same referees for a second look and i will ask them you know can you make sure all your concerns have been adequately addressed so not only have they been addressed they have to be adequately addressed now this is a very common misconception of the peer review process where the author is trying to make a run for it and the poor editor i'm the grim reaper at the end because i'm the guy who rejects the paper i think this is very unfair and this is very untrue because i personally believe the author the peer reviewers and the editor are all colleagues working in the same space and we are all trying to achieve the same objective we are trying to publish the best version of your paper that is possible okay so we are not here to hammer you or clobber you with swords and clubs and stuff when we do blunt edits or peer review comments please always always bear this in mind that what our comments mean is i care about your academic development if i didn't care about you i won't give you any comments right i don't have enough time to appreciate all the good things you did it's a bit like life where 90 percent of the time you do a good job 10 percent of the time you screw up but 90% of the feedback you get in life from your parents, from your teachers, from your colleagues is constructive, okay? Nobody tells you when you're doing a good job. Similarly with peer review, what you've done good is fantastic. Feedback is about your academic development, not anything personal, it's not about you or your worth. You are fabulous, there's nothing about you. I'm trying to help you improve your research work so that we present the best paper to my readers, right? So what peer review comments or edits don't mean is you have not done anything wrong it just needs to be improved always always accept feedback with a constructive frame of mind no matter how carefully i word it you have to be in the right frame of mind to receive feedback so here has come to manuscript revision okay you've got your referee comments do you agree or disagree up front tell me so it can be i agree with the referee yep fine if you disagree why do you disagree what is the evidence Referee comments can be of two broad categories. Sometimes the referee will point out an error. The error needs to be corrected. 
Other times, referee will have a personal preference. They'll say figure three doesn't add anything. Remove figure four. Remove table two. You can disagree. You say no, 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 no. Figure three is very important because I'm trying to emphasize this finding, and I think it should remain. And then let the editor decide. Then you go on to what revisions were done. State, you know, either you did new experiments or you revise the text figures. And where can I find those revisions? Because I, if it's major revisions, one, I need to find them. What changes have been made? Two, I may send it. I send back to the referees. They have to be able to find out what you've changed. So page and line numbers, updated figure numbers. Sometimes you only state revisions have been done according to the referee comment. What has changed? You know where has it changed? So briefly state what was revised. Always refer to the page and line number, and in the manuscript, you submit always submit two versions of the manuscript: a clean version and a highlighted version. A highlighted version, you can use a different color of text. You can highlight with yellow, blue, green, whatever fancy is you, and make it very, very clear what portions have changed in response to referee comments. Makes everybody's life easier. So you must address all reviewer comments. You can't selectively cherry pick the ones that suit your point of view and ignore the rest. You have to provide a reason if you disagree. Indicate exactly where the changes were made. Use color text. I will act, or the editor will act as an adjudicator, and ask for an extension of the deadline if required. If you need more time, I mean, we realize most researchers are working day jobs, and you know, writing a manuscript is over and top of your nine to five job. By all means, most good journals. Have more copy than they can publish instantly. So, by all means, write to the editorial office, ask for an extension, two weeks, four weeks. I've had extension requests for two months because they wanted to go back and conduct new experiments. So, don't be shy. Ask, ask the editorial office for an extension. Coming on to journal selection. So now you've got your peer review. You've done everything. So this was where you're going to find a journal to submit your work. Obviously, metrics. Everybody looks at the impact factor. No matter how much you try to sweep it under the carpet, it is still an important metric. And what is more important is impact factor. It's not the end all and be all of everything. It, it doesn't tell you the stature of the authors or the journal for that matter. But it is just the most instantly recognizable metric. You know, most people. I when I introduce myself as a journal editor, first thing they'll ask me, "What's your impact factor?" It is. It's a fact of life. These days, impact factor is based on citation, sign citation index metrics, and Elsevier has Scopus, and they calculate a cite score, which they've recently rejigged into a three-year citation window. So they claim it has certain advantages over the impact factor. So cite score is coming up. Article level metrics becoming very important in a digital world. You know, go to the journal website. What are the download statistics? Like I just said, 18,000 downloads, 23 citations. Alt metrics, you know, are the news outlets picking it up? Is the, is the New York Times talking about it? Washington Post. What are the rejection rates of a journal now? Everybody wants to submit their manuscript to New England Journal of Medicine. They have a rejection rate of 98%, you know, outright. And even after revision, they will have rejection rate. So the 98 is pretty much they won't even consider you. And again, sometimes it's very important speed of publication. What are the turnaround times? Go to the journal web page. Most journals will give you a metric on how quickly they turn around papers because maybe you're heading towards the end of your PhD, maybe you're heading for a promotion interview, a job interview, and you would like citation details. So instead of submitting to a high impact factor journal, which takes 12 months from submission to publication, you might choose a modestly lower impact factor, but a journal that turns around things in 90 days. You know, look for these things. Most good journals will show them on their landing page. Indexing again. Are you indexed? Now people understand indexing as indexing on PubMed, which is the National Library of Medicine of the government of the United States. And they have a selection committee that vets the journal, and you are rated on five criteria. A journal has to score a minimum four out of five to get Medline indexing. And you should not confuse Medline indexing with PubMed indexing. PubMed has slightly looser criteria. And PubMed is not Medline, so the two things are different. You can Google the differences on them, but you have to go through the National Library of Medicine Selection Committee to be a Medline indexed journal. So when people ask you, is the journal indexed? Is it on what's the impact factor? They mean indexing on Medline, and 
the Clarivate Analytics Impact Factor. I am emphasizing these points because there are lots of spurious, dubious impact factor organizations and lots of indexing services which pretend to be the real deal. They, they, they will say science impact factor, science impact factor, scientific you know, importance impact factor. They all try to sound like the Clarivate Analytics impact factor, the original one. They're not. They're trying to fool you. And we will talk a little bit more about when we talk of predatory publishers. So indexing means PubMed, Medline, two very different things. Reputation of the journal in the field. Okay, so what is the reputation? Which, you know, is it is well regarded? Talk to your peers, talk to your mentors, talk to your senior colleagues in the department. Go to a conference, discuss journals there, suitable journals. Audience, now our flagship journal is drugs. Drugs covers everything about everything in pharmacy, pharmacology, and a lot of, Cardiology professionals don't want to submit their work to drugs because even though it has an impact factor of 6.1 or 6.2, it caters to everybody. It, cardiology, the right audience is not reading drugs. So they send their paper to the American Journal of Cardiovascular Drugs, which is more modest impact factor, but a much more targeted audience. Open access options. These days, everybody wants the whole world to read their research work. So does the journal provide you open access options? You know, green, gold and options to include enhanced features these days you can like i said enhanced uh, electronic supplementary material could be a word document could be a pdf file it could be a video it could be slides you can do a lot of creative stuff on digital enhancements which would be hosted on the journal homepage, and there would be a link in your manuscript people will just have to click it and they can access the video on the journal homepage. some journals offer this ability some don't so before you submit your book Take a look at that. Here are some journal selectors. Don't bother noting everything down because these slides will be shared with you. Uh, my colleague Mabel probably after this presentation or tomorrow. So the first one is a Springer selector. Here you, you can identify impact factor range, open access options, and you just paste your abstract into this box online and they will suggest suitable journals. And they'll give you a break of the journals, Medline Index, Open Access, Impact Factor, everything. But it is limited to Springer Nature journals. Similarly, Elsevier have their own beta version of a journal finder. Again, those are limited to Elsevier journals. And there's another one called Jane, Jane Biosemantics. It is across the board. It is across Walters Kluwer, Elsevier, Springer. And the last time I checked, Jane was free. So you could, you could actually paste your abstract in there and you could use finer, you know, fine tune it to, it should be indexed on Medline, it should have an impact factor more than one, it should offer open access options, and then just click search, and these journal selectors will suggest journals to you. Nothing is ever complete these days without any mention of predatory journals. Predatory journals do not follow the proper editorial process. They have fake editorial boards, they have fake bogus impact factors, bogus indexing services. It is all a smoke and mirrors screen to fool researchers into submitting their hard earned research work to them. They either don't have peer review or they have a fake peer review. You throw a hundred dollars, 200, 150 US dollars at them. They will publish your manuscript within two days from submission. So you have to be very careful because once you submit their, your work to them, they will not let go and you will get no sympathy from me. So in the World Association of Medical Editors, we had an issue where some authors came to us and they said, you know, we submitted our work to these publishers. And it's only when they asked for a thousand US dollars publication charge that we said, no, 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 we want to retract our paper. So they won't retract the paper. They won't let the authors withdraw the paper. And even without the submission fee, they published the manuscript online. So now the poor authors came to the World Association of Medical Editors and saying, you know, this is my life's work for three years of my master's degree. I worked on this paper and they published it in this fake journal. Nobody's going to read it. Nobody's going to cite it. And, you know, we have three and a half thousand editors in that group, World Association of Medical Editors. Not a single editor was willing to take that work because where is the novelty? It is already online. People already know the result. Why would I republish a paper? I don't really care if it's published in a predatory or a fake journal. So you, the onus is on you, the author, the researcher. Be very, very careful before you submit your 
precious research work to a journal. Now you can access the directory of open access journals, DOAJ. They vet the journals, they list. Occasionally a few predatory ones had crept in that list, but they are working very hard to weed them out. And then there's this think, check and submit org when they prompt you to actually look for these things you know do your colleagues know the journal can you identify the contract the publisher is the website informative is the publication fees upfront can you see it so these are free resources for all researchers and i strongly encourage you to use these free resources before you decide to submit your work now here's a letter i keep getting from this journal i've i've been to these guys so many times to please remove me from their mailing list they want me to say i'm a journal editor i don't work in the lab anymore so the world journal of advanced healthcare research they claim to have an impact factor 5.46 which is more than any of my journals but the scientific journal impact factor from some fake organization in morocco you know why they're a fake organization they may have an office i don't doubt that point is their metrics are flawed they don't tell you where are they using the source data from where are they collecting this impact factor you throw 100 us dollars at them they will assign your journal an impact factor okay so if you just looked at the impact factor you would say oh this is the right impact factor for me but look at what database they're talking about when they say indexed the journal is indexed in various reputed international indexing bodies not indexing databases indexing bodies what what they don't tell you what bodies you read a little further they say the first september issue has already been published online yet on 29 or september 20 issue they're still asking for my submission as soon as possible to be included in the september issue which has already been published and i got this email on the 29th of september and plus the use of color for god's sake where do these guys live so this is an example an extreme example of where you should not submit your work and of course, like I said, every good figure should make a visual impression and should leave a mark on the reader. So I leave you with the predatory publisher, which is a wolf in a journal's clothing. And that's a free access article in Nature published in December 2019 You have the link below. You can access it for free. The link will be included in my slides. And I encourage you to read that article. It's, it's how you define a predatory publisher and how you should be careful of predatory publishers so thank you so much for your attention i've just summarized everything here just to prompt you to ask questions so that you know what we discussed and what we talked about and hopefully you will have some questions ready my 60 minutes are up thank you yeah thank you so much dr abitab it is a wonderful presentation uh, we have a few questions for you uh first of all um can you explain more on conflicts of interest I know this is quite a general question, but maybe um, if you think of something yes. that is important to the audience. Yes, uh, the most important thing, I think what everybody understands is financial conflicts of interest. So I have received a grant from um, a drug company and I'm doing their work. So somehow I have a conflict of interest or I serve on their advisory panel. They pay for my conference travel. So financial, con I have shares you know, in Pfizer, in, in Novartis. So financial conflicts of interest are the widest. Then there are other intellectual conflicts of interest where you can recuse yourself about, I always disagree with this group or you always clash. We have uh, you know, intellectual differences of opinion. There can be geographical conflicts of interest because as we know, there are lots of um, animosity across geographical territories. They can be between one particular country and the other. So you can have a conflict of interest of, I don't want to review work from these people. So a number of conflicts, you know, it's not a conflict of interest is a perception that somehow a relationship can bias your decision. Okay, that's a conflict of interest. And it's not so much as the bias itself, but a, a perception, okay? So it is why we call it a potential conflict of interest because it is, it is a perception of bias and it is always, advisable at least in my book to declare it up front that okay these are my potential conflicts whether it is relevant to our current work or not that let other people decide that whether it be published or not is not important but to hide a potential conflict of interest is unethical you know it can be i i don't like people from one country in particular 
and it's just I will I have an axe to grind with them. I will always reject their papers. Full stop. I don't want them. You know, I have had a bad experience with them once. I think they all cook up their data, which which is my bias. Okay. Now, how open are you to admitting a bias, and how diplomatically can you word it? Okay. That is the declaration of potential conflicts of interest. Or I've worked. I've had papers. You know, this person is working in New York. I found a reviewer in in California, and the reviewer has come back and said, no, actually, I was a co-guide of his master's thesis five years ago. And although we haven't published together, I know him intimately well, and you know, I don't want. I I want to recuse myself. I don't. I have a potential conflict of interest. That's not financial. That's that that is being upfront and honest that we have a relationship which you don't know about from looking at the you know Google or PubMed. I I don't want to review this work, and that's fine. That is a perception of bias. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think I think more or less cover it. Um, and then another question is about the ownership of the um, author right. So what are the ownership and the distribution rights of an author? Whose manuscript has just been accepted by Springer Nature or other publishers. So, is he or she allowed to have their own copy of the finished article to share with other researchers? Uh, you have to check, uh, check the journal individual journal policy on this, because, like I said, we are increasingly moving to this open access. Everybody wants their research to be shared freely, not behind a paywall or a subscription wall. But now, certain funders like the National Institutes of Health, United States. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Howard Hughes Foundation, Wellcome Trust, they mandate that if we're funding your research, it should be shared freely. But they do allow for a 12-month embargo. So once your paper is accepted for publication, you have to talk to the journal office of what are your policies about sharing this. So if you know the accepted version of the paper before it has been copy edited and turned into a PDF file, that is the accepted Word document. You can post it on your personal website, your university website, or that is called green open access, and that doesn't involve any payment. But occasionally there will be an embargo period, so you can do that with our journals in Springer Nature. It's a 12-month embargo. So if your paper is accepted for clinical pharmacokinetics, for instance, you can share it. You can put it up on your university website after an embargo period of 12 months. If it is a standard manuscript. If it's an open access manuscript, it will be open and freely available right from the word get go. Okay. Again, you have to clarify because it takes us about uh, two and a half weeks from acceptance to copy editing to proof checks, and the PDF file goes online. So two to three weeks. That is the delay where your paper is not visible. And then, if it's open access, it's visible to everybody. They can download it. They can use it. But if you want to use the green access, the green open access. Then you have to check the journal website and the individual publisher policy. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's clear. Um, the question next is: um, There are talks among non-native English speaker authors that there are bias among reviewers and and editors, so the review become too straight or nonsensical. So, what is your comment on that? Ah, uh, again, I. Uh, I want the manuscript, like I said in the beginning, the cover letter should be grammatically correct and not too many typos in it. Which these days, I'm coming from a point of view of you know, if you're using Microsoft Word, it highlights in green and red, you know, typos and grammatical errors. So that's the level I'm coming from. It doesn't have to be prose and poetry. We are not into in English literature. We are not talking Shakespeare level here. Okay, so it has to be understandable. It's a scientific paper. It's not English literature, but sometimes because of English being a second language, you know, they, they the authors translate from their native language to English in their head, and it becomes very clunky, and then it distracts from the science of the paper. So, what is most important is the science, the novelty, and the importance. Okay, if your paper is really novel and the findings are very important. We will do everything we can to beat it into shape. Okay. Now, in the old days, we could, we still have copy editors. So after acceptance, we have people who will tinker with. They, I call them wordsmithing. They won't rewrite the paper. They will correct the semicolons, the apostrophes. The co they will improve the paper. But 
sometimes peer reviewers will say that you know i can't really get through the paper because the english is really bad so please ask these authors to get their paper read by a native english speaker there are uh, english editing services there are lots of them available some are even on the springer nature website which charge you for it you know and some authors can pay are happy to pay some are not but just using an english editing service in no way affects my acceptance or rejection decision okay it does it does improve the kind of feedback you get from referees because instead of note uh, focusing your attention on the english language they will focus on the technical aspects of the paper which is what you want technical referees to do you don't want them to look at the english grammar so i'm quite happy for authors to just get it looked over by a colleague who is fluent in english so that the science comes out clearly okay and then once if all the referees have said the english needs to be looked at by native english speaker at the revision stage the authors could or could not you know may choose to may not go to an english editing service they may work on it themselves they may get a couple of colleagues to look at it and then if it's that important and the technical aspects have been addressed our copy editors will finally get the proofs right mm. okay so it's not a bias it's not a bias but if people are pressed for time and there's a paper they can't understand the abstract and people are short of time trust me they are then you could be drawing the short straw right correct so actually um your your answer also um uh fit for another question because it is also about the the english meta so i think um you have mm -hmm. answered that already Okay. And, and and also after this um uh presentation we will send some links of our websites for the author services to the UMT library yes. that they can share it out. Yes. Okay. Um all right. So um the, the next question is you had shared that the autonomy of a good manuscript uses pickles uh but would this also apply to non medical related subjects or mat, uh, manuscripts uh, i tried i tried to dilute the p cost to okay it's not just the population but what's the problem that you're studying it's not just the outcome but what are the results that you achieved so i'm trying to make it broad see even if it's if any of the sciences you know social sciences so i'm not going as far as social sciences but any of the physics chemistry biology any of the sciences original research pretty much remains the same peer reviewer remains the same editors remain the same broadly speaking so if the title contains the essential elements what you're trying to do is when people are searching for information these days gone are the days when they used mesh terms in pubmed you know that was that time it was the only game in town these days google will answer questions everything you know anything which google can answer you have to consult god but people will google people will google questions they want an they want an answer from google so if you've taken the keywords of your research and you weave them woven them into your title it will show up quickly there are whole i mean there are companies that work on search engine optimization to make sure that you turn up on the first or second page of google searches because google searches go on for like thousands of pages nobody goes beyond the first few so you want your research work to show up in the top few and how you going to do that so broadly p cost remains correct but again if it's not intervention and population and a comparator group just look at the keywords put them in the title what would readers look for what terms would they use to find your paper are those terms in your title okay yeah okay and the next question is about apc um the open access of apc and uh, the high apc in some journal is seen as an early selection process that that is purely financial reason uh, which may dampen good science conducted in not so wealthy researchers or agency so what is your comment on that the high apc in some journals yes now again we are, we are guilty of this because i think the nature group of journals have the highest apc in the biomedical sciences is something like 5000 us dollars and most of the aids journals that i work for are in the vicinity of 3000 3500 us dollars and these things are not premium value they are in they are calculated by how much would 
we earn from pay-per-view revenue or from subscriptions or from whatever from a manuscript and this is the average amount and just because because once it becomes open access we will never earn a penny from that neither today nor ever it's a one-time thing so given the number, huge volume of submissions to nature i mean nature accepts i think less than one percent of submissions so i think most of the money spent on nature is actually reading the submissions and rejecting them rather than selecting the best signs because you have to go through 99 percent to find that one percent okay now given the wide range of apcs available and so many publishers in the market it's up to it, the power is with the authors you know you can choose the journal that works for you and you have to balance these things of okay do i really want nature is it really that good and then is it worth the 5000 would would i say settle for a slightly lower impact journal with a more manageable fees another thing i would like to point out is that we are entering into deals of read and publish deals increasingly springer nature enters into deals with institutions with countries so suppose we we have deals with european countries we have deals with certain universities most recently with a university in india manipal university where we have an agreement where they will access nature journals and their authors can publish in nature journals open access for free they don't even have to pay the apc so there are creative ways where springer nature and all the other publishers i'm sure are working with models of how to survive when everything is freely available everywhere everything is open access right but you do need a publisher more so to add value in terms of it, when wikipedia gives you all the answers but you don't trust them so you need trustworthy sources who then need resource like me to actually spend time and a lifetime of 20 years sifting through data cherry picking the best which i think is most valuable for my readers and that you will need to compensate for the editor's salary hosting the content forever you know you go to a predatory publisher which charges you 100 us dollars and they accept your paper they publish it online and then two months later they shut shop and they vanish and your research vanishes it's no longer available it's gone because they couldn't afford to keep up their website so these are all things you have to weigh and it's not always the apc you have to look a little more closely into what your university's agreements are and whether you qualify for a waiver and lots of times you will get an apc waiver you won't have to pay anything even in springer nature journals does that help? Yeah, I, th I think that helps. And also, uh, after this talk, I can um, send all of you a link uh, on our website that is about the waiver of APC. Uh, and then you see if you are el eligible of waiving the fees or, or what is the criteria of uh, having this waiver. Um, and then the next one is how to write a good manuscript structure for policy review at critical review. Uh, is it still the same with research article? No, 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 no. Uh, in particular, I mean, this. I'm talking. Uh, I'm assuming this is a narrative review. So you're you're writing a review article, not an original research article. So we, for one, don't want you to use Imrad headings in review articles, narrative reviews. So in the good old days, you could you could write a review article on any topic of your choice, whether it was calcium channel blockers in hypertension or whatever, and people just accepted it for. You know, they either knew you, you had credibility in the field, or you worked for a university that was credible and people would trust the university. You know, you have to trust the author of a review. Anybody with access to the internet can write a review. You know, just by reading abstracts, you can write a review without actually having read the full paper. So we want, as a reader, I want to be able to trust your depth of knowledge, your, your ability to critically analyze the information and present it to me. You know what are the slice that you've got so the title again you won't have a p course in it you would definitely have what you're focusing on what is your intervention and preferably what patient groups so you can have pharmacokinetics uh, you know of a drug in healthy volunteers or you could review the population pharmacokinetics in in elderly people so it would not be p course but you would try again for keywords in your title. The subheadings would be more creative. You know, I, I want each subheading to be a little teaser. 
of what's in the paragraphs below the heading. So you're writing a narrative review. In the old days, nobody wanted a search strategy because we just trusted you to have picked the right thing. Those days are long gone. These days, everybody has access to PubMed. Everybody can Google search and Google Scholar. So even narrative reviews, you will provide some kind of guidance of how you sifted through the literature. It doesn't have to be a search strategy like um, systematic reviews. You know, it's not that rigid, but some guidance on I searched these databases with these key terms, and I looked for this particular outcome. And I selected papers that meant, you know, had a minimum of 100 patients or whatever the primary criteria were. So even though not as stringent as a systematic review, a narrative review should also have a certain, I wouldn't call it method section, I would call it search selection strategy, literature selection method or literature selection strategy. Then I would go on to, okay, effect of this thing on this particular topic. And then I would put subheadings, creative subheadings, and then possibly get away with conclusions. Conclusion is fairly neutral, but not IMRAD. I, I, I particularly report the IMRAD headings from narrative reviews. They're not helpful because you don't have results. You're not discussing the results. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. given the uh, limited time, we can only take the last question. Um, so the question is about uh, plagiarism. So how does an author yes. avoid unintended plagiarism when writing the method section? Uh, because it yes. is often found that the majority of methods are, are written very similarly. Yes, I, they, they, I mean, I, I must congratulate the attendees. They've asked some very, very good and pertinent questions. This one is particularly pertinent because, you know, when I was a writer, sometimes I would read all the primary data and then I would try to synthesize them into my critical analysis. And some of the papers had stated the results so well that even if I didn't want to inadvertently, there was a lot of reuse of those phrases and words. You know, what do you do? They've said it so well, but you have to say it in your own words. You you just simply have to say it. You have to paraphrase. You know, you, you have to use a different selection of words. I know it's hard. Uh, and sometimes people have grilled me on, okay, what level of duplication is acceptable? Put a number on it. There is no number on it. Uh, the anecdotal, again, I, I, I'm a dinosaur. I fall back to rules of thumbs, you know, rule of thumb. The cut off of 30%. 30% of an original research paper, most of which is in the method section. Because if you are describing a, a, a well-used method like HPLC or what have you, there is only so, this is the way to do it. I mean, this is the way to use this instrument. There is no two ways of doing it. You can't be creative in the method section. So I agree. In the method section, there is going to be a certain amount of unavoidable duplication. You can cut it by, again, using fewer words, putting references, don't give the whole method in detail, and looking at it, you know, put it through Google or Google Scholar, and then changing a few words. But again, use, use references. Again, this 30% ballpark is the upper limit of normal, right? The alarm bells start ringing beyond 15% duplication, 15, 20, 22. So it's not an absolute cutoff. 30 is absolute maximum. Of that duplication, there should be, obviously there will be some in introduction, a few words and phrases will be in introduction because this is a very common disease. There will be some in discussion because you're discussing other people's work. Preferably if you're quoting people, put quote marks. So if there is a verbatim sentence or two sentences, and it's in quote marks, I will let it go because it is somebody else's words and you are acknowledging they're somebody else's words. There should be zero duplication in the results. You know, if any red blip shows up in the results, that's, that is going to get a magnifying glass out and I want to see exactly why. And again, it's not uh, and the, I mean, come on, we, we, we have common sense, we are reasonable people. We will look at that. But it's what gets our attention is strings of sentences you know, uh, an entire paragraph, you know, five sentences in a row or 15% or different, you know, one sentence and three sentences in introduction, five sentences in discussion, all from the same source, which is not you, you know, it's somebody from Poland. That's not acceptable. That you are basically creative lifting. Okay, does that help? Yep, that very helpful and very clear. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Abitab. This is a fantastic uh, presentation today. Um, 
I think if we stay here for a longer time, there will be more questions, but unfortunately we are not able to. Um, so this is almost the end of uh, the publishing talk today. And after the webinar, there is a survey. Uh, appreciate that you fill in and help us understand what you think about the webinar and what you would like to know in the future. A follow-up email will be sent to you together with an e-certificate. The slides today will be shared by UMT Library later. Um, so thank you once again, Dr. Abitab, and thank you for okay. all the thank you. audience to attend. We hope to see you all in the future in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.